This is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. Last week, we left off talking about prophecy numbers, in particular the number four. The last thing I mentioned was that in the Bible, there are four places. They're all spoken by Paul, or I shall say the Holy Ghost spoke through Paul. And he mentions four times in the Bible about something other than what's written in these four books. Because Paul mentions 2 Corinthians 11, another gospel. And in reference to that, he says another Jesus and another spirit. So I think they all are part of the same package. When you open that box from Amazon and it's another Jesus, you can bet there's going to be another spirit and another gospel with it. But also, he mentions in Galatians, another gospel. That's the second time. And then twice more in Galatians, any other gospel, any other gospel. Total of four times. Four times we're warned in the scriptures about something that would pretend to be the same as or better than what's written in these four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And I, when I ponder that, I always see that I believe that God speaks in order. We don't find any random confusion anywhere in our Bibles. When we read it, we can see that clearly every thought, every sentence, every thoughts in sentence form, every, every word is in the right place. It makes sense, most of it. But even the parts that I don't understand, grammatically, they are correct. God is a God of order. Paul said, let all things be done decently and in order. It's the devil who always brings chaos, right? Confusion. But God is a God of order. And so to me, it just seems logical that if the number four was related to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these four books, the four Gospels, then the idea of a false or a counterfeit or a fraudulent Gospel also be mentioned exactly four times and voila, there it is. In fact, I'll give you this right now, the word Gospel itself or Gospel and have an asterisk by, if you take a look at it, that means if you go to purebiblesearch.com, download the free software free. Free as in free hot dogs. Um, I must, must be lunchtime. Um, free, totally free and forever free. Pure Bible search software. Type in the word gospel, G-O-S-P-E-L, and then put an asterisk by it. That tells the software to look for the word gospel in any of its variants. Gospel, gospels. It's only like one. But anyway, You'll find that word exactly 104 times in the King James Bible, which is a multiple of four. It's 26 times four. Even when Paul described precisely what the good tidings were, the good news, what the gospel means, means good news, great news. This is fantastic. It's like the best news of all. When Paul described it, 1 Corinthians 15, you know, most theologians say, you know, Paul's one who described what the gospel is. Notice what he said. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that, notice I have these underlined, number one, Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. Number two, that he was buried. Number three, that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Number four, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, and after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. So in Paul's description of the gospel, I don't think Paul knowingly did this. I, he's being led by the Holy Ghost to write these words down. Holy men of God spake, as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And Paul, certainly speaking this, we know that Paul had somebody write his letters out for him. So here, in describing the gospel, the Holy Ghost gives us four details. Number one, Christ died for our sins, was buried, rose again the third day, and seen. 
That's the point of the four Gospels, is that everything about Christ was done openly. Everything that he did that was of importance to us was not done in secret, hid away. He was seen. He wasn't some mystical uh, person that existed in a temple that everybody said, oh, he's in the temple, and yet nobody's ever seen him in there. Kind of like the Ark of the Covenant thing down in Ethiopia where there's this big Coptic church down there, and everybody says the Ark of the Covenant of Moses is inside that church. And when you say, can you let us go in there and see it? Oh, no, it's forbidden. Nobody can see it. How do we know it's in there? We don't. But Christ, everything that he did was open. So I think that that should be part of it. That he not only died for our sins, was buried, rose again on the third day, but he was seen. And then think about what Jesus said. Go ye unto all the world and preach the gospel. And in the beginning of the book of Acts, he says, um, let's see, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria. He's not done. In the uttermost part of the earth. Four places, the four things of the gospel, of the four gospels, go to the four corners of the earth. And there's a time period in here. We'll get to that in a little bit. But I just think that God speaks in order. So anything related to the story or the idea of the word becoming flesh, dwelling among men. I mean, think about the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist denies that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. It denies it. So that, to me, is going to be part of a false gospel. When it really presents itself to the world, I think God's people are going to know. It's going to be chaotic in some way. It's going to be out of order. Or, and it's going to be exactly what the Bible warns us about. It's going to be another gospel, but Paul said it's not really a gospel. It's not, it's not good news. So, God speaking in order. I mentioned uh, John, the fourth book, John chapter one, and the fact that I covered this the last time, the fact that you have the word, word, capitalized W, in here exactly four times in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and then verse 14 and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us so to me that just makes sense when you compare it to DNA here's the word right here the word of DNA the code of DNA is not necessarily in the rungs these are the support mechanisms for where the word is revealed you get that the word is revealed in these four base pairs. Adin, thymine, cytosine, guanine. Did I say it right or did I say guanine here? Well, anyway, you get the idea. So let's go to the fourth book of the Old Testament. And we're going to see that as this matches this, seek out the book of the Lord and read, no one of these shall fail and none shall want her mate. So, here is the book of the Lord, and this side is perfectly mated to this side over here. So, let's go to the fourth book of the Old Testament, Numbers chapter 21. We have a story, and what we're going to see in this story, in the fourth book, is a picture of the gospel. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. Think about the serpents. Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now stop right here. Let me just throw in a couple things. This would be absolutely for free. I won't charge you for this one. You can see from this passage that brass would be a symbol for fire. Since Moses didn't actually make a something out of fire, he made it out of brass. And thus the Bible is telling you that brass is a symbol of fire. 
That's just the extra. It doesn't really have anything to do with what. But anyway, make thee a fiery serpent. So, and we know that because the people complained, God had them to be bitten by these fiery serpents. What does that signify? We go back to Genesis 3 in our study from the number 3. We know that the serpent came and out of his mouth came his poison. He delivered it to Eve by way of the words that he spoke. He spoke those words to Eve and that poisoned her and it brought her death into this world. For the very first time, death has now been injected into this world by way of the serpent's poison. And it causes death. So think about these people being bitten by the serpent. Well, you and I have, absolutely for sure, we've been bitten by it. We carry it in our DNA. We carry it with us. We're born with it. We die with it. And our children are born with it. And that is we are born in sin and transgression. And there's only one cure for that sin. There's only one cure for that poison. There's only one anti-venom. And it's the gospel. Jesus Christ. So think of that serpent now. The book of Colossians tells us that Christ made a show of his enemies openly on the cross, triumphing over them in it. So Everything about the cross and Jesus on that cross somehow, some way, is a symbol related to the curse of sin, our enemies, be it the devil or all the devils. Uh, the Antichrist is there. Um, did I say our sins? Death itself is represented there. And Christ destroyed all of our enemies there on the cross. Now, I want to bring something into this little discussion. Isaiah 14, 29, Rejoice not thou, whole Palestina, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. For out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. Now, the reason why I brought that forth is you see in Numbers 21, fiery serpent. But we know then from Isaiah 14 that not only were those serpents made of fire, or they were fiery somehow, they could fly. Think about stories, parables, tales of old, of flying serpents that breathe fire. What are we talking about? Dragons. Who's the dragon? Satan, our enemy. The reason why I thought that was interesting is when I went to look for graphics to put on here, I found there's multiple versions of this, but older type graphics, old drawings and paintings of this story of Moses putting a fiery serpent on a pole, these serpents had wings. Take a look at this. This is like an old lithograph from an old book or something like that. And notice that the serpent has wings. It was a fiery flying serpent. If you recognize the caduceus or the rod of Asclepius that Hermes or Mercury holds in his hand and it just happens to look like DNA, right? So the fourth book of the Old Testament, Moses lifts up a fiery serpent and God says, whosoever shall look upon shall live. Now, what, what magic was in the brass pole of a serpent that instantly, magically cured them of serpent's poison? It wasn't magic. Something far greater than that. It's faith. Because, you know, there's anti-venoms for serpent's poison. If you get by, by a, a snake, a rattlesnake, copperhead, whatever, I mean, there's an anti-venom for it. We can kind of cure that now. Back then, they didn't have anything like that. And that kind of venom from those kinds of serpents, there is no medical cure for it. There's only one thing that can do that, and that is faith, belief. It can make you whole and free you from the serpent's poison. 
So Jesus in the fourth gospel, the book of John says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up. Think of it, take a look at that fiery flying serpent there on that pole. That's a foreshadowing of Christ. Not that Christ is Satan. Oh no. But remember, Christ was a representation on the cross of all of our enemies. The dragon himself being destroyed, that fiery flying serpent being destroyed by Jesus' death on the cross. So, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You'll note that the phrase, Son of Man, which is used here in this passage, it's found 196 times in the King James Bible. That's 49 times 4. If we narrow the search down to the New Testament, that's 88 times. That's 44 times, or yeah, 44 times 2. If we narrow it down to the four Gospels, it's found 84 times in the four. That's also, that's 21 times 4, by the way. I think God speaks in order. But remember, the, here what it's saying is the antidote to the poison of sin is faith. Christ died on the cross. Do you believe that? Do you believe that he died for you and for your transgressions? Do you believe that he defeated all of your enemies against whom ye fight there on that cross? I do. And have been cured of the disease of being bitten by the serpent and being poisoned to death by him. And I love it. The venom, the anti-venom to Satan's poison is Jesus Christ, and the delivery system for that is the four Gospels, in fact, the whole of the Bible, and we believe what God said. It's all about faith. That's the Gospel right there. It's all about faith. Now, remember, you have the four Gospels, four, then you have Paul warning us about another Gospel, and another Gospel is always going to be related to another Jesus. So think about it. Christ is the Son of Man, but he's also the Son of God. Now, is he more man than God, or is he half man, half God? He's all God and all man. Now, I can't explain how that works. I just know that Jesus is all God and all man. God truly is his Father. Mary, the Virgin Mary, truly was his mother. And so the Holy Ghost coming upon Mary produces the Son of God and the Son of Man. But then the Antichrist. I think the Bible is giving us enough clues to let us know the nature of the Antichrist, where he comes from. His father is certainly not God. I believe his father is the gods. He is a son, just like the NIV puts it, a son of the gods. But he is also, I believe, a child of man as well. You remember in Genesis chapter 6, the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and produced these hybrid beings. We call them, the Bible calls them giants. They're called Rephaim, Nephilim. There's called all these different names in the Bible, but they are the giants and they are hybrids. And I believe that the Antichrist is a combination of both the sons of God or these gods and a child of the daughters of men. And I don't think he's fully of the gods and fully of men. I think he's half God, half man, half male, half female, half heaven, half earth, half iron, half clay. I'll get to that in a little bit. The reason why I bring this up, you know, that fiery serpent thing in the DNA. Take a look at this. Now, this is the other gospel I was talking about. The false gospel. See, it's an ancient symbol. This there in the middle is an ancient, I believe it's an ancient Sumerian symbol. Notice the leopards with 
eagle's wings. That's interesting. And notice you have the two-headed, this is actually one serpent. If you follow it all around its twisted little DNA thing, you'll find that it's the same serpent, but it has two heads on it. And it just looks like the form of DNA. I want you to notice there on the right is, of course, what's called the caduceus, which looks like DNA. And of course, there's the wings there. And then over here on the left, I want you to notice this. Up at the top, you have the sun and the moon. Those are opposites. They represent day and night, or light and dark, good and bad, positive and negative, yin and yang, sons of God, daughters of men. Because the sun is always masculine in the Bible. The moon's always feminine in the Bible. And so you have a man rising up out of the sea. Stop and think about that for a minute. A creature rising up out of the sea. That's Revelation 13. Back to this. And he's holding that rod or wand of Asclepius in one hand with the two serpents, DNA. He's holding an orb of the world. And above him is written, Phileas Noster. Now, I had, to, I had to look that up. I kind of thought I knew what it meant, but I wanted to make sure. Phileos means, it's Latin, means sun. Noster means hour. If you take a look at it, the sun and the moon are looking upon their son, who is holding the serpent DNA. You can kind of take a guess who he is. This is the a son of the gods, a child of the devil himself. This is a picture of the Antichrist. And the our son, I think, is a reference to the sun and the moon here, the male and the female, the yin and the yang, the opposites. You understand what I'm getting at. The false gospel, the other gospel that Paul warned us about, is going to bring in the false Jesus by way of a false spirit. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 37. The four winds mentioned in Ezekiel 37 represent the four gospels. Verse 9, Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me. And the breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. I think this is a prophecy of Israel, but it could be us. We were, the Bible says we were dead in trespasses and sins. And it's the four winds, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine. You see, this is what gives us life right here. The word becomes flesh. This is our life. This is our breath. When Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, Receive you the Spirit, Jesus then said, John 16, he said, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And where are the words that Jesus spoke to us? Well, they're actually in eight books of the Bible. That would be four times two. But most of them are in those four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So I think those four winds, I think this slain army is Israel, and I think Ezekiel prophesying to the four winds represents the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John preached to Israel in the last days. I think they're going to live again. In fact, I know they're going to live again because that's what the Bible says. And they're going to do so by way of the death of Jesus Christ for their sins, his burial, his resurrection according to the scriptures, and they're going to see it, the witnessing of the Son of God. Hebrews chapter 4, the Bible says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. He's speaking of Israel. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Now, what is he referring to here when he's talking about the gospel was preached to them, meaning Israel, in the wilderness, as well as to us, but with them it had no effect because they didn't believe it. The only effect that it has in us is that we believe it. 
you're probably like me. You came to a point in your life where you said, God, I surrender. My sins have overtaken me. I can't do this. I can't live like this. I know I'm going to die and go to hell. God, is there any hope for me? I know I've done terrible things. Am I too bad? There's nobody. Nobody's too bad. The gospel is for all of the worst sinners in the world, Paul said, of whom I am chief. Now, if Paul said, and he wrote this by way of the Holy Ghost, if Paul says he's the chief of sinners, that kind of lets you and me off the hook, right? I mean, we're not as bad as Paul, but we're pretty rotten. Christ died for everybody who believes. I mean, that's why he said to that thing about the serpent on a pole, that they'll look on it, they can live, and they're going, and we have medicine for that. That's not the way we would normally be cured of snake venom. But God wanted to show back then what he's showing to us now. That if they'll believe what he said. They can, be, they can live. They can be whole. They can be cured of the venom of sin. And so if they looked, they did it because they believed. And after all, you're dying from snake poison. What have you got to lose? I, mean, that, I would say that to anybody listening to me. You've tried every religion in the world. You've fallen for just about everything to come across YouTube. And you're starving to death and you're dying and you know it. What have you got to lose? God said, taste and see that the Lord is good. All you got to do is try it. I promise you, I promise you, you'll love it. But he said it was not mixed with faith and they didn't believe it. And what was he referring to specifically? This particular passage refers to, we go back to the fourth book of the Bible, the book of Numbers, because after they've wandered in the wilderness now, they've gotten to a place where they send 12 guys, one from each tribe as witnesses, to see what that land really is all about, that land flowing with milk and honey. You remember they come back and they're going, it really is a land flowing with milk and honey. They come back with one cluster of grapes on two there's two guys carrying one whole cluster. This thing was giant. But then they told about the giants, the sons of Anak, and all the walled villages and how the walls and the buildings reached up to the heavens and everybody there was a giant. And 10 of them, 10 of them represents the law. 10 of them said, we can't go there. We're not going to do it. It's not going to work. We're all going to get slaughtered and killed. See, so that's what the law does. The law, all the law tells you is you're going to die. That's all the law does. You remember how long those spies were in there? 40 is that number. 40 days. So now you know why. I mean, look at this passage again. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. He mentions the gospel. So to me, it just makes sense that whatever... Paul was referring to here in Hebrews must have had something to do with the number four. And sure enough, they were in there 40 days. And after 40 days, they come back and they tell the story of the promised land. It's as good as God said it was, if you'll just believe it. So Numbers chapter 13, they return from searching of the land after 40 days. Look at verse 31. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which came of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, so we were in their sight. And so 10 of these men, and we know it's 10 because we know 12 went in and two of them told the story of faith. So let's see, 12 minus two, that leaves 10. 10 said, there's giants in there, we're never gonna make it, right? They were in there 40 days. That The gospel, this gospel, they had a land. It was a promise of God, it was their salvation. All they had to do was believe. God would have snapped his fingers and killed every one of those giants if he wanted to. And Caleb tried to convince the people of Israel. 
In Numbers 14, verse 6, Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes, and they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not. Remember what rebellion's like. It's like witchcraft. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. You know, I like this. You know what Joshua and Caleb are saying? We eat giants like them for breakfast. I like that kind of attitude. They're bread for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. Look at verse 24. You'll see the difference right here. But my servant Caleb, because he had, look at here, another spirit with him, and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereunto he went, and his seed shall possess it. His seed. His seed is one, two, three, four base pairs that join together that make the word, right? So 40 days, these two guys come back and say, of course we can go in there. Let's believe what God said. It's heaven. It's what God promised. Let's go there. And we find out why, what the difference was between Joshua, Caleb, the 10, and all the rest of Israel. You see, I'm telling you, whenever there's another gospel, there's another spirit, and there's going to be another Jesus. And in this case, we find that Joshua and Caleb had the right spirit, another spirit, a different spirit in them. That was the spirit of belief. That's, you know, the seven spirits of God. You just know and you understand and you have wisdom and you trust in the Lord. So that tells us then that all the rest of Israel had a different spirit in them. It was the spirit of unbelief, the spirit of Antichrist. They believed the ten. Think about it. We know the beast has seven heads, but how many horns? Ten. We know the fourth kingdom is in the feet, and it has what? Ten toes, which represent ten kings. You see it now? The real gospel gives us salvation from the curse of the law through belief, through faith. The false gospel brings in cruel authority by way of these ten kings Ten commandments, ten laws, ten spies who told them, you're going to die if you go in there. You can't go. Let's make us a captain and go back to Egypt. That's the false gospel there. That's the other gospel. Now, take a look at Daniel 3.25. Since the gospel is the death, burial, resurrection, and the witness of the life of Jesus Christ, those four gospels, so we see the Son of God showing up before the Gospels, and he's called the fourth. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, this is Nebuchadnezzar, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Now remember a while ago when I said a son of the gods, that would be the Antichrist, right? Well, you've heard me say this a million times, the NIV, the New American Standard, uh, the new English, revised, let's see, the new, I can't keep up with all the new versions now. The Holman Standard, they all, all the modern translations corrupt Daniel 3.25, including the Swahili Bible. Mwanawa Mungu is different than Mwanawa Miungu. The Son of God is not a son of the gods. Because that's what all the other translations say in Daniel 3.25. They've got the wrong Christ, the wrong Jesus inside that fiery furnace. Okay? But think about it. Here's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, three. And here we are, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Who can save us 
from the fire. Number four. The fourth, who is the son of God. And don't give me that stuff. Well, Nebuchadnezzar, he was a pagan, and he multiple gods, and his theology was, you know, all these gods, so he would have called him, he would have called him a son of the God. Uh-uh. No. When he saw Jesus in there, he knew. He knew who that was. Anyway, so, now the question is, there's four people in there. It's seven times hotter than it ever has been. All the soldiers that threw him in died instantly. And yet Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Jesus, the Son of God, are in there. And notice this. The princes, governors, captains, and king's counselors, one, two, three, four, being gathered together, saw these men, upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was an hair of their head singed. Neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Did you count all that? Princes, governors, captains, king's counselors, that's four, were gathered together, saw these men, whose bodies the fire had no power, number one, nor was an hair of their head singed, number two, Neither were their coats changed, number three, nor the smell of fire had passed on them, four. How? We I can keep it simple and say it was Jesus protecting them, right? I get that. But I think there's a, an actually a, a real biblical, mathematical, and scientific answer or reason why they were not affected in any way by this fire. The four things about fire, uh, let's see, had no power, it singes hair, it changes their coats, and it makes you stink, right? Four things about fire had no effect, and these four groups of people saw that. And the fourth is like the Son of God. So think of all the number fours here. God's telling us something. He's telling us about a location, a place, a dimension that when you're in it, everything or anything in this dimension can't even touch you. Let's look at it. Ephesians 3.17 that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. So stop right here. Now, I remember reading this going, oh, the Bible's going to talk about three dimensions because there's three dimensions. This way, this way, and this way. But then it mentioned a fourth one, and I went. I, I didn't, never thought of that, never thought of a fourth dimension. So I had to look it up, and I did some reading about what different mathematicians, physicists, and others would say or were saying about the probability, not just the possibility, but the probability of a higher spatial dimension, something that is in a direction that right now you and I cannot point in that direction because we can't fathom it and yet the Bible's giving us the details the Bible wants us to understand with all the saints the breadth the length the depth and height and you would say well isn't height and depth the same thing well isn't breadth and length the same thing depends on how you look at it right and yet we know that there's this way this way and this way three but there's a fourth one and it's called, in the King James, height. This is part of, the, part of the Bible thing, the whole Bible thing that I like. Three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, all tied together in one beautiful knot that gives us understanding in one language. So you take this one word, this purpose of the Pure Bible Search software, is so you can take this one word, search it through all the scriptures, get understanding all right so let's go to job 22 12 it's not god in the height of heaven behold the height of the stars how high they are so we know two things number one 
that where God is, is the height of heaven. Actually, Paul said there were three heavens. You think, well, how, you know, how, what does that do to your theory? Yeah, but four locations. Earth, first heaven, second heaven, third heaven. That'd be God is in the fourth place away from us. Okay, God is our father thrice removed or something like that. But anyway, God is in the height. So the Bible refers to this fourth dimension as height. And he says it here in the height of the heaven. And then behold, the height of the stars, how high they are. The Bible says stars are angels, right? So they are in a fourth. We can see them in our dimension. What little bit we can see, those little lights in the sky, but we also know that they are in the spiritual realm as well. And we know that spirits can do things that we can't do. They go through walls and, you know, whatever. That if you were in the fourth dimension, would you be affected by three-dimensional fire or three-dimensional smoke or anything like that? The answer is no. Let's look another place in the Bible. Psalm 102, 19. For he hath looked down from the height of his sanctuary from heaven. So the Bible's equating those two things again. From heaven did the Lord behold the earth. Proverbs 25, 3. Heaven for height and the earth for depth and the heart of the kings is unsearchable. So we have three witnesses in the Bible telling us, explaining to us that the heavens or the heaven, the top heaven is a place called height. And it is in a higher, it's not just higher up in the air. It's in a higher, completely higher dimension than anything else in this creation. Take a look at this. I want you to look at the second verse I have on the screen. Revelation 21, 16 is actually describing heavenly Jerusalem as a city that lieth how? For square. Now, he could have just said it's a square, but he said four square. And I think with everything we've seen so far, that matches what the Bible says about a fourth dimension and that heavenly Jerusalem as a city is in that dimension. It lieth four square or whatever, but it's it's in the height of the heaven. And truly, there is no place in this creation that matches the city of heavenly Jerusalem or New Jerusalem because it's in a wholly different dimension, a higher dimension than anything else in this creation foreshadowed in the tabernacle in the Old Testament, Exodus 27, thou shalt make an altar of shittim wood, which is acacia or thorn tree, five cubits long, five cubits broad, and the altar shall be four squares. So that takes us back. The altar, of course, is where the sacrifice was. And the four square altar shows us Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And that, that sacrifice, the gospel, is going to go to Jerusalem, to G Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. It's contained in the four gospels. You get this idea that it, number one, represents the sacrifice of Christ in the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And we saw this last week. All four gospels, even though they tell different parts of the life of Jesus, all four of them talk about his death, burial, resurrection, being seen of witnesses. All four of them do. That's the gospel. But then, because it's a foreshadowing, remember that word, shadow. Because it's a foreshadowing of the one in heaven, the altar and the temple in heaven, that it's eternal. Christ's sacrifice, even though it was 2,000 years ago, even though it was 4,000 years, 4,000 years, get that, 4,000 years after Adam, 400 years after, after the last Old Testament prophet prophesied, which is Malachi, in the 40th book of the Bible, you have the beginning of the gospel, which is the book of Matthew. I just thought I'd throw that in there. But anyway, because it is, that it's four square, 
related to the fourth dimension, it's eternal. It's everlasting. One sacrifice for all time, past, present, future. Now, if you have a hard time with that, just remember that Christ was described as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. His one sacrifice, four square, is timeless, everlasting, past, present, future, no matter how you look at it. Now, take a look at this picture, and I want to explain something to you. A fourth dimensional object, this is something that I learned in studying the fourth dimension. A fourth dimensional object casts a three-dimensional shadow. Now, I want you to look at this picture. Kind of funny, isn't it? You're looking sort of down. I got this from Wikipedia. You're looking down upon two people, and primarily what you see is their shadow. Now, the people in this picture are three-dimensional. They have this, they have this, and they have this. They are three-dimensional beings, but they cast a shadow that is only two dimensions. It's only this way and this way. Shadows are never, you can never touch them. You can never feel somebody's, although some creepy people, you, anyway, you can never really feel a shadow. It's only two dimensions. So a three-dimensional object casts a two-dimensional shadow. A fourth-dimension object or person or thing will cast a three-dimensional shadow. Remember, I always use this term foreshadowing. That's a literary idea where, like at the beginning of a novel, you'll see something that foreshadows the end. All right? The Bible is full of shadows. Three-dimensional representations of fourth-dimensional people, places, or things. And they actually use this, that exact word in the Bible. Hebrews 8, for if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law who serve unto the example and what? Shadow of heavenly things. As Moses when was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for, see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Now think about what we know about the tabernacle, that it was like an elongated square. It had four corners. The, the wall around the tabernacle had four corners four corners. The gate had four pillars. When you go to the sanctuary itself, the entrance to the sanctuary is four pillars. And you think about the numbers. You're outside the tabernacle, means you're on earth. You go into the courtyard, that's the first heaven. You go into the sanctuary, that's the second heaven. You go into the most holy place, that's the third heaven. That's the fourth place. From where everybody else is and only God and the high priest can be there. Why? Because God and God alone is the most high God. All right? But just think about what he's saying here. He's saying that that tabernacle was a shadow a three-dimensional shadow of a fourth-dimensional tabernacle in heaven. Jesus being not, and remember what tribe Jesus came from? Not Levi, the third tribe, Judah. Fourth, it makes sense now, doesn't it? Not only is it linked to the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but it's also linked to what the fourth dimension is that it's a higher dimension, and they say that the fourth dimension is time. I believe that because outside of the three dimensions that we live in, linear time is nothing. Linear time governs everything that we do in this realm. 
but it does not govern the spiritual realm or the fourth dimensional realm, whatever you want to call it, spirit realm or whatever. That world, that realm exists above linear time. So that's why it's called everlasting, eternal. That's why Christ's sacrifice on the cross, right, is an everlasting sacrifice. His blood is everlasting blood. And it's all this, everything in this Bible is a three-dimensional shadow of heavenly things or the Bible says things to come. Let's go back to the fourth book, the book of Numbers. From Numbers chapter 4, you have those who were put in charge of the tabernacle. The sons of Kohath were in charge of the furniture and the instruments of the tabernacle. Eliezer, the son of Aaron, was in charge of the oil, the offerings, and oversight of the tabernacle. The sons of Gershon were in charge of the curtains and the hangings. And the sons of Merari were in charge of the boards and the pillars. So think about it. The tabernacle is where the atonement is. The salvation is. The blood being sprinkled and the sacrifice and all that pertains to the salvation of Israel was right there in the tabernacle. And God had four men. They were, they were the ones who brought the gospel in the Old Testament. They were all from the tribe of Levi, including Eliezer, the son of Aaron. They were the ones responsible for when the children of Israel moved from place to place. Those four carried their gospel with them everywhere they went. They four were the ones who brought salvation to the people of Israel, just like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John brings salvation to the entire world. Think about the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah, it was square. But think about the Ark of Noah. It was this way and this way and this way, probably square. I don't know, maybe a long rectangle. I don't know. How many people built it? Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth. Those four men God used to bring salvation to all the people that God was going to save. Those four. Hmm. Now, take a look at Daniel chapter 2 because what we're going we're gonna to end it this way. We're going to show you the showdown. If all this number four talks about the real gospel, you see it in the book of Numbers, you have the four that brought the gospel, you have the four men that built the ark, four guys that preached the gospel. Now we're going to see the false gospel, Satan's religion, Satan's man, up against the real gospel. And it's done in the book of Daniel, chapter 2. You're going to see, and in this, we're going to see, have a revelation of what this false gospel, this other gospel is all about. Because as Christ has his kingdom, Antichrist has his kingdom. Guess what number it is? Don't say it yet. We'll get to it in a minute. Okay? Daniel chapter 2. The Bible says, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams. I love that. One, two, three, four. Wherewith his spirit was troubled and a sleep break for him. Then the king commanded to call, count these, the magicians, the astrologers, that's two, the sorcerers, number three, and the Chaldeans, that's four. For to show the king his dreams, so they came and stood before the king. You remember when Joshua and Caleb said, don't rebel against the Lord. We've been here 40 days. Don't rebel against the Lord. Rebellion is as the sin of what? Witchcraft. The devil's religion is always witchcraft. There's only one other religion other than true religion, and it's witchcraft. It's a religion of performance, a religion of works, a religion of say the magic words, say the right words, say it with positive thoughts, say it with pixie dust or whatever. But it's a, it's a witchcraft 
gospel is what it is. And you have these four magicians. From where we get the word vizier, B-I-Z-I-E-R. Those were the, uh, the grand vizier was the man who always counseled these Persian kings. Well, he was a magician. The word Wicca and witch and wizard all come from the word wist or wise. And it all has to do with, like, like they have a super knowledge of everything, all right? So the magicians, the astrologers, what do astrologers do? They look at the heavenly lights, which are given for signs, seasons, days, and years. So there's the connection. The magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans. Now, I don't know what the Chaldeans were there for, but obviously they had a lot of false witchcraft religion stuff in them. But Nebuchadnezzar was using these four men to be his top advisors. So he has his dream. And you remember the story. He says, I don't remember what the dream is. You tell me what it was. They said, tell us the dream. And he said, I don't remember the dream. Oh, king. No, no king has ever asked anybody. In other words, they're trying to get him to change his mind here. They're sweating. And Nebuchadnezzar is starting to catch on. God is moving in Nebuchadnezzar. Because in Daniel 1, 2, 3, and 4, you know what you're going to see? You're going to see the salvation of a man named Nebuchadnezzar going from a pagan king to one bowing before the king of kings. Anyway, Daniel 2 is part of that because God is showing him that his false gospel system, his false religion, Satan's religion, Satan's devils, all telling these guys fake and phony words, fails and God has four men that are going to give him good counsel. Let's read who they are. Daniel chapter 2 verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Should not perish. I like that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see that? So you have the magicians, astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans up against Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And I like the fact that their Hebrew names are given here, not their Babylonian names. I think God is separating these two groups here. No doubt in my mind. So Nebuchadnezzar puts out the call and he says, if you don't tell me what my dream was, then I'll have it figured out that you've been lying to me all this time. You've been giving me lying and corrupt words. That's part of it. So Daniel goes to Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah and says, let's ask God that we should not perish with the others. And so what happens? They prayed. God saved them. God gave Daniel the understanding of what that, I mean, how is it that you would just know what's in a guy's mind? What he dreamt the night before? How would you know that? Because Joseph said it back in Genesis. When I was thinking of Genesis 40, when Joseph interpreted the two dreams, 40. Okay. You have the gospel there. You have Joseph. I got to say that Joseph who is in prison for sins he did not commit, right? And he's preaching the gospel to those spirits in prison. That's what he's doing in Genesis 40. Anyway, uh, who can interpret dreams but God? So God gives Daniel the interpretation. And here it is. He's going to reveal to him that fourth kingdom. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron. For as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they, who are they? They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. 
So the big question, who are they? Is it the they as in, you know, they say it's supposed to rain Thursday. You know, they say that eating that stuff's good for you. You know, they say that the earth is not round, it's flat. Who, is it they? Who are they that mingle themselves with the seed of men? Who is this? What is this fourth kingdom? Why are they mingling themselves right here? Adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine. Because this is the seed of men. Why are they putting themselves in there? Ephesians chapter 6 tells us, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. And notice the fourth, against spiritual wickedness in high places. They, those four, shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. There are tons of religious ideas around the world throughout history where they have all mentioned something like heaven and earth joined together. You remember back when we saw the uh, Phileas Noster, our son? Our son, that child is they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, because he's holding in his hand the caduceus, the DNA serpent, okay? So, am I crazy? Yeah, but probably not for this reason. I think with all of my heart that that fourth kingdom is not some political force that sweeps across the world. I mean, that's been done how many times? Hitler, Alexander the Great, the Roman Empire, Genghis Khan, I mean, you name it. It's all been tried by men and they've all failed. This one's going to succeed, only temporarily, but it's going to succeed. And heaven and earth are going to be brought together. They, those four types of devils, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. That is your fourth kingdom. And that also is your other gospel that comes in by way of another spirit that's going to produce another Jesus. Now, next week, remember the 40 days that they were in, you know, pr the promised land, scoping it out, looking it out? How many other places in the Bible do you see like 40 days or 40 this? 400. Those places, now that we've got this basic understanding of this number four, when you see 40 days, 40 years, you see 400 things, 400 people, when you see those 4,000, when you see those things now in the Bible, you'll understand it. You'll see it in a way that you've never saw it before, but it's right there in the scriptures. Okay? So next week, we're going to look at those 40 days. How many days did it rain? How many days did Jesus fast? How many days were they uh, uh, searching the land of Canaan out? All of those places in the Bible where it mentions 40 days or 40 this or 400 this, we're going to look at those next week. Study them. Take everything you've learned so far and study them yourself and see if what you come up with and what I come up with, see if they at least kind of match, all right? Yes, I'm trying to get you to study your Bible, all right? Even if you set out to prove me wrong, I don't care. Study your Bible. And oh, by the way, Christ did die to save you from the poison venom of sin. If you'll just believe that he's your Savior, call upon the name of the Lord, thou shalt be saved. This is Pastor Mike. I love you. You're the reason why we do what we do here at Bethel. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.